Hello and welcome to episode 23 of Art Snaps. Thank you for joining me. My name's Katie and I'm the engagement officer for a project called Art on Tour at Swindon Museum and Art Gallery. And since touring art has become very difficult because of COVID-19, we've been developing ways for all you lovely people to learn about Swindon's art collection from the safety of your homes, including this series of talks, which involves me picking a theme every week and three artworks to help us explore that theme. So this week I've gone for the landscape, which I guess you could say is a pretty traditional theme or subject matter in art history. Early manifestations of the landscape appeared in Western art in probably around the 15th century when artists began to explore nature to a greater degree than ever before. So here I'm thinking about landscapes as backdrops like the kind that we see in The Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci. And as a subject matter, landscape gradually came into its own in the centuries that followed. And it's fair to say that throughout the ages, landscape painting has been revolutionised in a number of ways. The 19th century being particularly notable for the likes of Turner and Constable, who brought new layers of realism and romanticism to British landscape painting. In the 20th century, it remained a popular subject matter, but transformed again dramatically under new artistic developments. So today I'm going to look at how landscape as a genre or subject matter responded to modern art movements and modern ideas. And I've really been looking forward to this because I get to speak about three of my favourite artworks in the collection by David Bomberg, John Piper and Graham Sutherland. So let's begin with the earliest of the three paintings, which is David Bomberg's The South East Corner, Jerusalem of 1926, which is on the screen at the moment. Bomberg is a great artist, a really interesting artist, who really led radical new developments in British painting in the first half of the 1900s. He was a founding member of the London Group, which formed in 1913 and showcased the most modern, cutting edge art practices in the capital right through to the 1930s. And I guess you could say this was art that did something other than simply reproducing a scene or promoting a moral message. Modern artists were responding to the immediate world around them emotionally or analytically and creating artworks with a heightened visual impact. Now, I guess that might sound like a bit of a sweeping statement and that's probably because it is, because there's no clear formula for modern art. Art in the beginning of the 20th century was all about invention and personal response. And even among artists of the London group, there were dramatically different approaches. And the artists themselves changed their styles dramatically or developed them in very different directions from how they started out. In Bomberg's case, early on in his career, his work was all about celebrating the speed and dynamism of the machine age through abstracted angular shapes and blocks of colour. But as you can see, Swindon's piece doesn't match up to that description. The southeast corner was painted in 1926 after Bomberg's traumatic experiences of World War I. And like many artists who had previously been inspired by the progress of the machine age, Bomberg decided to go in a different direction to the one that he took before the war. So Swindon's piece probably isn't as edgy as Bomberg's earlier work, but we can see that he still employed a very simple yet impactful visual language, which focuses on the dazzling light, jewel like colours and geometric shapes that dominated the landscape. And as we can see, he has reduced the scene down to its essential characteristics, describing them with rich, thick strokes of paint. And the result is this really impactful and atmospheric landscape, which seems to be drenched in light and colour. The next two pieces I'm going to talk about are by the neo-romantic artists John Piper and Graham Sutherland. And before I go on, I want to chat about neo-romanticism for just a little bit, because it's a really interesting art movement, which emerged in Britain in the 1930s in the face of the threat of World War II, and continued into the 1950s in response to the scarred landscapes left behind after the war. 
So landscape paintings by near-romantic artists tend to convey emotion through heightened imagery in a similar way to those of romantic landscape painters of the 19th century. So here we're thinking of the likes of Joseph Mallard William Turner, who's probably still the most famous English landscape painter of all time, for the incredible intensity of feeling within his work. John Piper was working around 100 years later in a neo-romantic style and for him it was all about evoking the spirit of a place and the way an experience of it is affected by characteristics such as weather or season or the topography of the landscape. Swindon's piece Pistol Mice Glasau depicts a waterfall with a 600 foot drop which he painted when he visited Gwynedd in Wales that year. Piper painted this piece in 1940, during a time that he was particularly interested in waterfalls, which are of course very powerful and spectacular, so there's great potential there for an artist wanting to convey drama within their landscapes. And I really think Piper has captured the immensity and energy of water rushing down the rock face here. There's this all-consuming darkness, which when you look closer reveals a great variety of texture tones and colours. And the more you look, the more it reveals, as is the case when looking at anything in the dark whilst our eyes adjust and begin to pick up more detail. But initially, before we take any of that in, we're hit with a wall of darkness, with this illuminating strip of water slicing through it. And I think it helps that Piper painted it on the spot, which gives the piece incredible immediacy too which we can really see in the expressive marks throughout the work. Look at the diagonal lines of the turbulent sky along the top of the image and the freedom with which the flow of water is depicted. Piper has used so many different marks to convey movement within the scene. And this, along with the strong tonal contrast, give the work great presence and atmosphere. It's as if we too are standing in front of it and taking it all in. Our final artwork for today is by Gray and Sutherland, who actually have quite a lot in common with John Piper. They were both official war artists during World War II, which essentially meant that they were funded by the government to record the effects of the conflict. And they were both known for their neo-romantic depictions of landscapes and architectural ruin, as well as powerful religious artworks after the war. So I think it's significant that we have landscapes by both of them in the collection, which were painted in the 1940s, because they're both great examples of neo-romanticism's aim to convey emotion through nature, particularly at a time where anxieties about conflict were running high. Landscape with Rocks is one of a series of studies Sutherland made in 1944, which depicts a rocky coastline in Pembrokeshire, which was a constant source of inspiration to the artist who is known to have mockingly called himself G. Pembrokeshire Sutherland, as his name became so strongly associated with that particular place. Sutherland described Pembrokeshire as strange and exuberant, full of darkness and light, and decay and life. In discussing the effects of light on the landscape at sunset, he said, quote, Its rays precipitating new colours turn the red cliffs to tones of fire. Unquote. And we can of course see this reflected in the burning colours of landscape with rocks. And of course, in modern art movements, colour was often used expressively rather than representationally. And perhaps we can see hints of European art movements here, such as Fauvism, which was all about expression through colour, and Cubism, which was all about space and form, and maybe even Surrealism, which is about untapped potential and dreamlike worlds. Certainly, I do think there's something otherworldly about this landscape. Sutherland has captured the strangeness that he spoke of, and the magical and transformational quality that he loved about it. It feels like he's let his instinct take over. He's stripped away the insignificant detail or what he felt was the insignificant detail of the scene and allowed himself to hone in on the burning colour, the dark shadows and the sharp rocks. And I think this shows how neo-romantic artists were responding emotionally to landscapes through modern and also very personal visual languages. 
and also with an awareness of the anxieties which shaped the world that they lived in. I can't ignore the fact that this piece was painted in 1944, when Sutherland was still working as a war artist, and just a few years after he painted some of his most affecting images of London after the Blitz. In this context, there's something quite devastating and post-apocalyptic about it. And once again, I've gone on too long. So with that, I'm going to end this episode of Art Snaps by saying thank you very much for listening. If you enjoyed learning about these landscapes from Swindon's collection, please do feel free to follow us on Facebook or Instagram using the handles on the screen. We're always posting lots of artworks from the collection. And at the time of recording, we're focusing on landscapes and there's plenty more to see. Also, if you love this episode, you might want to have a listen to episode 17 of Art Snaps, The Great Outdoors, which also looks at landscapes from Swindon's collection. Thanks again for listening, take care and do stay safe.